Hi, this is Danny Gorney, a writer and creator of Cygnus Imperium, Sleepwalkers, The Myth Butcher, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at DJ Crash Override, uh, and hopefully support my Kickstarter for Cygnus Imperium issue two, which will be live in early June. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented creator writer of this amazing comic I just happened upon recently. So we are joined today by the ever-talented Danny Gorney, creator of Cygnus Imperium. How are you doing today? Pretty well. Thanks for having me on, Kurt. <laughs> For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, and of course, what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today, tell us who you are and what you're all about. Sure thing. So I am Danny. I am all about storytelling and the ways storytelling impacts identity. I finished my PhD in literature in medieval lit in 2013. Turns out the financial collapse was a hot mess. So uh, I've been working as a freelance writer in Toronto ever since. In 2016, I realized I need more narrative in my life as compared to business writing that was paying me things. So I just started writing stories. And one of the first projects I started working on, Sleepwalkers, it turned out the entire concept just worked perfectly as a graphic novel. I've always been a big fan of the genre, the medium, and I love writing to the strength of the media. So I wrote it out and started getting it in production after a bit. And I've been doing that ever since. My first campaign was live when the pandemic hit for a print comic. So that really threw a wrench into the plans. But I decided to go heads down and write as much as I can. And Cygnus Imperium is one of the things that came out of that. I have to say, I, I love the writing. I love the, con I love the character interactions. And I definitely love the colors of, of this book. Because from what I got to read... You throw everything at the wall. I mean, like you, there's action galore, which I love. And the dialogue actually is what really intrigued me because at least you're seeing the different voices and the different um, character developments throughout at least the first book that I got to read. The themes of Cygnus Imperium, what kind of sparked the beginning of the comic itself? So Cygnus Imperium, I'm totally giving a shout out here. I did this interview for this like James Bondy cryptid anthology I kickstarted in the beginning of 2021 with two geek girls, this podcast out of uh, Arizona. One of the things we ended up talking about was Star Wars and how the Mandalorian was just super cool. Personally, I, at the time especially, was feeling so done with Star Wars as a franchise, even though I loved it so much as a kid. And they were like, no, no, The Mandalorian is real Star Wars. It's a Western. Go do the thing. And so I watched. I was like, oh, yeah, I could write a Star Wars. And I was like, hold on a second. I really want to write a Star Wars that does the Star Wars things. It's got these heavy emotional stakes for the characters. It's got a sense of crisis from the beginning. It's, it was a good exercise in starting, like, action forward for writing. There was a significant amount of political turmoil going on uh, south of the border as you may remember. Yeah. So I just imagined myself to myself, well, what would happen if George Washington came back from the dead and saw this? <laughs> it, it turns out the answer was punch it all to death with a giant robot. <laughs> so that's sort of how the story came together. You're talking about the voice and the character voice and dynamic. A friend of mine, Marcus Cho, his book, Joyride, mm -hmm. Which is basically, you know, Kirk, Spock, and Bones steal a spaceship and and go on the run. So I'd read that recently, and I was like, okay, yeah, actually, I love the idea of having Star Trek characters in a Star War because you can have a slightly more detached or referential response to what's really a very action forward story. That was one of the directions I sort of borrowed from Marcus's book. I like the idea of thinking about Star Wars with respect to diplomacy and what it means to do all of the things that happened uh, before the most recent series started, which is to build a government. Mm. Instead of just being the resistance, what does it mean to start forming the government? Given the rigors of a war, uh, how, how does that change over time as you get more stressed out? So that's what the series explores. That sounds very serious. It, it, it's a book about a giant robot that comes <laughs> spaceships. 
and a former galactic empire who wants to kill everybody between him and his former throne while also being these things. <laughs> There's so many avenues I can go go on based on that. I, mean, you know, I tried to throw them out there. Uh, you, you do. Know, I'm loving softballs here. You are. And, and that's, that's a great thing to see. Uh, who is the artist that worked on, on this book in particular? Uh, this is Yarkin Sakaria. He's based out of Istanbul in Turkey. And as I recently discovered, I think this is his first comic that he's worked on that's being printed at all. So he still hasn't received his copies of issue one because it turns out shipping things to an economy that is in the middle of collapsing that's incidentally beside a war zone um, is slow. I started writing this and got some story done. I wrote some concept before and that he posted a portfolio up on Facebook. And I was like, yeah, I want this guy. Uh, which is how a lot of my productions have gone during the pandemic. I'm writing for me. And then sometimes I see an artist, I'm like, oh, well, I guess I have to produce this now because <laughs> this is perfect. And I really like that I can write a story and just sit on it. So we started drawing this in the spring of 2021. He really, really loved the first episode and came back to me like a couple of weeks after we finished the first one. He's like, I want to do another one of these. Here are the questions I want you to answer because I love these characters. Also, I'm going to give you a discount. Let's go. We've actually drawn issue three already. Oh, wow. Issue four is sort of on hold as I see how the Kickstarters go, but that's already written out. And I suspect this is five or six by the end of it. That's awesome. That's, that's really amazing. So looking at the scripts you've written and, and what's been produced, what was the scene that you wrote that the art just made it way better than you thought it was when you wrote it. One of the scenes that in um, Signus Imperium issue one, and that's the two page spread near the end, if you want to open up your copy to take a look, is this really ridiculous concept I thought of four years ago, something like that. I was having a conversation with a friend at this uh, reading event. I was like, I want to do farm punk, and I don't know what that is. The way I sort of translated that when I ended up on this deserted planet with like a lone hermit on it, I was like, hold on, what if the farm is the spaceship? <laughs> Yarkin kind of nailed it, especially those reaction shots. And it's just great, like, you know, the farmhouse is on fire. Ravana, the guy who made the Mac, is just standing in the palm of his hand, screaming obscenities at the fascists who just destroyed his building while his new allies are like, what is happening? And a robot is just stepping up out of the ground. And it looks like it's been there for long enough that, you know, <laughs> there's moss, there, there's all the tillage on top of it and that sort of thing. And that's, that's beautiful. Like, right. And like that little like zoom in, like Yarkid actually, if you can see the bottom corner of it has a little arrow pointing to uh, Ravada in the head. Mm -hmm. So this is the inset in the, the top uh, right there. It points to him just perfectly. It's like, no, no, this is what we're showing you. <laughs> right. Like every bit of this just lands. <laughs> I always find namology amazing and fascinating because it kind of gives you a glimpse of of a writer's creative mindset usually when it comes to what they've created in terms of either comic or prose or whatever. You know, what were some of the names that, that you came up with that just kind of sparked, you know, the creative journey of these characters that you've created? I don't think about names as much as I probably ought to. I mean, I am sort of more now. I, I wasn't so much at the time. I was just trying to get names that tried to sell the characters while also hinting at there being depth. I really liked Arik having a really neutral name while still being a female lead and also the violent one. That's very, you know, Worf in that sense. And, and that, that was sort of go for that neutral name and have the way the character acts, just really do it. Calamity is a hilarious name for an, for an engineer. So I went for that. He builds things. His name's Calamity. I think it's cute. That's sort of, again, uh, a name that doesn't immediately tell you what that character is going to be like, especially since we start them off in the middle of having their spaceship being destroyed. So, you know, we get to sort of learn who these characters are as they are responding to stress. And then Thorne is very Picard-esque. So uh, I tried to give him some name with some gravitas. Likewise, Ravana, a name with a bit of gravitas. And I think that sort of works. I'm currently writing a project called uh, M, uh, E-M, in which my protagonist is 
a 16 year old schoolgirl. every time she wants to sit down and study for her next exam someone summons her and tries to sell her their soul because she's actually Mephistopheles I mean that <laughs> so as far as neemology goes I mean that's a thing that sounds awesome actually <laughs> uh, it's currently an eight page short and eventually I'll I'll write more of it figure out episodic structure and find an illustrator so with everything that you created what is your creative kryptonite so, so many things. <laughs> Among other things, I'm in a really weird situation as a creator, especially with comics, because my first book got finished just in time to not sell it to any live humans at any convention. I decided I'm going to write as much as I can. I'm going to produce what I can when I can. And we're just going to see what sticks. I'm writing stories to try out concepts. That's fine and is working and I it's a good way to level up because when it comes down to it, the best way to level up is just do more of the thing and be as self-critical about it as possible. With comics, um, you've also got the additional stage of does this really translate, uh, translate to art? So that lets you and look at your work from a more detached perspective. I, I'm working on dialogue. I'm working on characters who have more internal drama that really drives their motivations and making that more explicit. I'm working on all of these kinds of things in very different ways. So, but each project, I've usually got like one thing I'm trying to test. Cygnus Imperium is like, I need to run action forward. I need to run emotions heavy. My graphic novel, even though it's superhero-y, is a really detached point of view, for example. And I didn't write it in prose. I didn't start production until I'd written out script for all 12 chapters of this book. We're currently in production for chapter six. That shows character development by showing character development. One of the things that's going on with my protagonist is that she's not talking about her problems. That's a bit more like me. At the same time, I want people to start talking about the problems. I'm, I'm working on M partially because a high school concept forces you to write characters who talk about and engage with their problems at the level of really small stakes. As a writer that you are, do you find that, especially with this pandemic currently going on, that writing energizes you or does it drain you? I feel like it's energized me. It helps a lot that I work better in groups uh, for a lot of things. So I'm going to write something and like put in a trunk and just like, maybe I'll find the right illustrator at some point. Sometimes it's just an exercise. Fundamentally... The second step gets into production, I get really excited. I need to hire more people. You know, I've got to figure out how we're going to sell this thing. That's really given me a great sort of sense of personal control. And I'm highly motivated to do this. The pandemic, I think, was a good opportunity for a lot of people to stop and reconsider and determine a new direction for themselves. It wasn't so much for me, but I certainly like doubled down with stuff I was already doing. It's very weird to imagine that like before the pandemic started, I, I would have been, you know, someone with nothing done. And then, you know, right as the pandemic started, I was someone with one book done. And now that things are actually opening up, like I did my first convention a couple of weeks ago in Chatham, Ontario, of all places. I was someone with eight books done. And I'm a nobody, right? It's really nice to be doing that and to think like, okay, actually I, I produced a lot. I am getting out and sort of selling myself as this full-on creative for the first time, and that makes me want to do more. And then, of course, generally, or at least the way I write, I keep writing until I stop sucking at it. There's a lot of small ideas that get thrown out or that I, I pick up from watching other or, or reading other things, and they eventually find their way into stuff um, when they've had a bit of time to percolate. So the more that you do, the, the more momentum it has, really, as a practice. I mean, you're constantly improving is what basically what I'm, what I'm hearing. I'm trying to. I mean, here. if I'm not trying something new, like why? One of the things I'm really committed to, especially on the indie comics side, is stories that are written with some kind of ending in mind. Like, I, I don't want to produce, you know, the next Spawn now, possibly ever. Most of my stories or worlds or whatever are things I, I might be happy to go back to, but I don't need to go back to like, here is a story. Okay. It ends hands off. Let's go do something else because as an indie creator, like you, you're really reliant on who's following you and to what end having them know that there's a story that 
will end and that if they're not they're sort of marrying themselves to you for this entire infinitely long series that might have an infinite number of production delays and blah, 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 blah. Like I like producing products that actually happen and I, I aim to impress people who give me their money. I haven't met very many of them in real life because, you know, pandemic, but I keep getting more followers. All of my crowdfunding campaigns would be pretty successful. So uh, I feel like that's probably working. And, and you have a great product as well, too. Um, I, I love the fact that, you know, you're, you have 12 issues in your mind and you've already, you're halfway there. So that's an amazing accomplishment. I mean, th that particular story, uh, there was no way I was going to go into production until I knew I was going to stick the landing. <laughs> and I'm glad I did it that way, too, because having written so much so early before going into production, now every project I do just makes me better. And because the production for this project is being kind of slow for Sleepwalkers and lengthy more than slow because there's so much of it. When I'm going back now, I'm just improving the dialogue, improving the pacing, improving the paneling. Is landing. Yeah, I'm really happy with how this is coming across. So then what's the hardest part about being a creative person yourself? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end of your process? I mean, finishing projects is the hard part, traditionally. Like, it's really easy to start something. For me right now, making time to start things is uh, really difficult. That wasn't the case, you know, two seasons ago. It probably won't be the case in the fall. I'm really, you know, focusing on the marketing right now. So that's taking a lot of time away from creative, but I'm still like writing story with an illustrator for another upcoming project. Really, if I were better able to manage my time and give myself, you know, half an hour a day to just write something, I'd probably be doing even better, even faster. And of course, financing everything is a hot mess, especially when you have no <laughs> idea what your revenue is like. Not selling things to live humans is unhelpful. <laughs> What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, that's a really good question. I've always believed that, I guess. But I mean, I was that kid, even in middle school, who would like go bury his face in a book. Two of the books that really got me into reading when I was young were The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and The Hobbit. And of course, The Hobbit has a lot of languages power in it. Language is power and magic. And it's one of the things that I really like about it. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy does very similar things with a very different tone. It's very British in the sense that like you can go give a very ridiculous concept and then establish it in a very funny way and then watch it go through the world in this very funny way. But ultimately you're still forcing people to think about something that's really cool from a very young age let's go read as much as I can. Let's go figure out as much as I can. This is one of the reasons I went into medieval lit. It was like, okay, well, I like fantasy stuff and D&D is really cool. And then you can like make a world with your words out loud on a table. And this is based on all this fantasy literature, uh, of which Tolkien is probably the best example because he's the modern archetypical fantasy example. And I was like, well, okay, fine. Now let's go see what other people are doing. And that led to reading a ton of Victorian lit, which is neo-medieval like once in future king and that sort of thing and uh tennyson I was like yeah let's go read some originals i learned a couple of languages at a really young age and of course as a canadian i had to learn french when i did my undergrad i learned japanese because obviously i'm a nerd that sort of led to like you know old middle english which is a lot of you know german-ish language and stuff like that so i keep looking for new ways to use language to express things and new thoughts that are enabled only by grammars that are, are foreign to me. Seeing that you're a, a, an avid reader then, what was your most recent literary pilgrimage that you've gone on? That's a good question. Closest thing I would say, I think the, the closest thing I would say to a literary pilgrimage that I took most recently would have been uh, in 2013, I did a research trip in England, uh, went to the British Library and the Lincoln Cathedral Library, uh, partially to read this, the Lincoln Thornton Manuscript. Oh, wow. Um, which is one of the two. And you, I think you can see the... Uh, uh, here, let me, let me take go. away your... There we go. Here's, sorry, I'm... Uh, no, you're good. There's a little King Arthur in the corner on the night. Yep. yep. <laughs> I can find you a silly drawing, too. At any rate, um, this is one of the two books I wrote my thesis about. Uh, and it contains like 15 
stories in Middle English in their only surviving copies, including the alliterative Mort Arthur. Yeah. So I, I got to touch that. That was fun. Went with my very not grubby fingers. That was a really good time. And one of the cool things about this manuscript being in Lincoln Cathedral is that it's actually fairly close to where it was uh, copied out, which would have been um, Pickering, England. So just a little bit more north there, also in Yorkshire. Here's a book full of stories that only exist in this book that I was really interested in. And I was saying something about the, the copyist slash compiler slash writer of uh, at the time. And I got to go and touch the book and read it. And it looks so much better in, in real life and is so much easier to read than this facsimile would suggest. And it was just great fun. Is there any questions I haven't asked you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? I generally approach the unknown with low expectations and I'm usually pleasantly surprised. Uh, I do like this is taking uh, some really interesting and fun turns. And so, yeah, like I, I got to talk about the book, which is the promotional aspect. Everything else is like, hey, I'm a cool person. Maybe you want to give a shit about my work. Yeah, we're good. At what point are we good enough? Oh, God. I put a lot of pressure on myself to do work that's at least equivalent to the stuff that's being published. That's partially because that's sort of my goal. I don't see myself getting the size of audience I really, really want in comics as a writer without being an illustrator, without the publication, just to get me out there. That's a moving target. Uh, but fundamentally, like I actually had a conversation with an illustrator about this. Um, again, upcoming project. I was on a video call with her and I had three books as, as props on the call. I was like, here is the minimum publishable unit for something that works in this genre. Showed her the art, showed her the book. Here is something very good that I like and I think we can actually hit. And then here is Eisner winning. This was sort of a conversation with the illustrator about like where we want to go and, and partially what kind of style we want to use, but also like what we want to focus on for her creatively so she can grow. I'm looking around at what everyone else is doing because I want to know what everyone else is doing. Like there's great indie books on Kickstarter. I'm supporting those and I'm talking to those creators the best I can. There's great indie books that are coming out by all kinds of publishers. I have a right, like a monthly budget where I go pick up the first volume of anything new I can. So I want to read these projects. If I'm telling the sort of stories I want to be telling, that's good. And then if, if I look forward and see like where I want to fit into a media landscape, I mean, I'm in Toronto. So ultimately the goal of doing stuff like conventions and, and things like that is to build an audience, to, to get people to, to care about me as a creator, to follow my stories, hopefully to be engaged by those, or at least to be interested by where I get weird, which is, I think, a fine place to be as a creative. You know, there's also a perfectly good film and television industry here, too. So good enough is where you're doing the sort of thing that you probably won't be embarrassed about later. And there's room for growth, uh, either upwards or sideways. And hopefully that was that answer was good enough. No, that was very good. I, I liked it. And, and every, everyone answers different. It's It's how they how they are as a creative person. No, no one path has ever been the same, especially from the people I've true. talked to. So and what's good enough is such an interesting question because it's so subjective to a degree and also not. And comics is a weird place for that. <laughs> you don't actually need a publisher to succeed in comics anymore, but you used to. And it's one of the few places where doing your own indie project is just as good because if you're trying to network doneness, is really important. Also, I mean, the fact that there's so many different genres and the fact that comics are a great medium for that. I think it's the most flexible medium when it comes to showcasing not only a writing talent, but an, an, an artistic talent as well, too, more so even than a, a film or a TV series for the most part. Um, whenever I try and explain 
the thing about comics to film people, you know, you can talk about the medium and how it's static and how you really have to do art direction and drawing and uh, storyboarding really differently because you're stuck with static imagery. Mm -hmm. But also like time to production is really low. It costs the same amount of money to do a space battle on a comic as it does to two people talking in a room. That is not true in film. Yeah. That's one of the things you can take advantage of is because you can produce whatever you want. Why the hell aren't you? What is the second wisest piece of advice that you've, you've received uh, that has stuck with you in your career? Oh, boy. I mean, certainly some version of done is better than perfect is up there. I don't even know what the wisest, what the wisest piece of advice would be. Maybe that would be it. I'm one of those really, really weird people who actually largely only listens to advice when I ask for it. But when I ask for it, I actually make a decision based on the advice that I've gotten. So if people tell me how they think I should live my life, sure. I might take it under advisement, but fundamentally it's um, of low consequence to decisions I make about myself. Whereas if I'm asking for it, it's something of high consequence. And I, I force myself to, to think about it that way. I, I just had a friend the, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a new friend. I, I asked a bunch of people for advice, including this person. And then when I told her, I followed her advice. She was like, what, you were actually asking for advice? A doctor might have bitch about things. And I was like, yeah, do people not do that? Apparently people don't do that. I don't understand how that's a thing that people ask for advice, mostly to talk about themselves. Uh, maybe I'm too straightforward with this. I'm convinced I'm normal and I keep suspecting that I'm not. And it's deeply troubling. And also I can't do anything about it. So I just get on with my life and keep doing what I'm doing until there's evidence for me to not be doing that as a good idea. That was a terrible sentence. <laughs> you can still print it. <laughs> How do you think the birth of creativity was formed? Theft, borrowing, restriction. There's a lot of creativity that happens of people just trying to copy other people's stuff. And, and some of that ends up in really cool places. And some of that's actually fairly successful and it's really easy to market. So it's got a lot going for it. Copying as compared to theft, you know, very much like I described Signus Imperium. Like, I basically want to do Star Trek characters in a Star War. So let's have these fundamental set up pieces and then have them play in their playground and see how they do. So that tends to go in a different direction faster for me. I mean, if I ask you to write me a story that doesn't give you very much to go on, but as you write me a story for tomorrow, I mean, you might write a journal entry. If I, if I ask you to, to write me a story about a family of rats that gain sentience and decide to take over the house they live in, and you have six pages to do it, I mean, you're thinking, right? I can see, the, I, I can see the look on your face, like, okay, what are you doing? Like, you know, oh, hold on, yeah, I can do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> And so restrictions um, and specificity actually force creative solutions, in my experience. And those put you in the situation where something is going to happen and also you're, you're working towards an achievable end while you're doing it. So tends to get, you know, finished with... Um, a lot more focus. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I know so many people who just do things. My entire peer group from high school is people who are probably more awesome than I am. I, I am not the only doctor from my peer group. Th these are all like people who like found a thing they really like and have really focused on and found success in doing that. So I never questioned that caring a lot about a thing I care about produces deep insight and knowledge and creativity. As long as I, I'm doing something I care about and I dive in and try to learn as much as I can, I feel like I'm going to be successful at something because knowledge in this respect is power. 
I don't really keep in touch with all of these people as much as I'd like to, but some of them I do. And they're all really great and inspirational in, in their own ways. So I just sort of grew up uh, socially in this environment where me doing the thing, the sort of thing I'm doing now was just socially encouraged. And I, I now begin to suspect that I'm much less normal than I think I am. Well, I mean, what is normal? But that's a question for another time. <laughs> I feel like I'm one of the normalest people I know, but that might be a suggestion that I've got a problem. If you enjoy your life, that's all that really matters. What is, yeah, nor normal is overrated. From a professional standpoint, you've created multiple comics and you have written many more to come in the future, which means that I have to have you back on the show to talk more about what you are going to be creating in the future as well, too. So professionally, you are successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I don't think so yet. I'm doing the thing. Uh, I'm happy doing the thing. Doing the thing is an important step to feel personally successful. Doing the thing isn't the same as, you know, seeing evidence of the success of that thing. I have been fortunate enough to be able to try to do the thing uh, and, and see where it goes. So that's a question uh, as we were talking about conventions and live humans and things like that. Um, I'm hoping to find better answers to socially, uh, which is weird. I know I can be happy enough doing the thing. I don't know if that makes me feel personally or professionally successful, but it was one of those for sure. <laughs> the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I love failing. Mm. I, I expect to fail. Um, I expect to fail constantly whether it's writing or anything else. I mean, if you don't fail, you don't learn and you're going to fail in new and interesting ways every time you do something. If you do something once and it succeeds and you don't think of anything you can learn about and try the exact same thing again and it doesn't succeed, you need to be introspective and examine why. And you learn by developing a policy or a process or a gut feeling that something's going to go wrong so you don't fail in the future. One thing that really frustrates me, and this is probably as someone who may well be considered talented, is that talent fundamentally doesn't matter. It's, it's putting the work in and it, it's learning what to do when you fail. And I think the thing to do is to get up. And if you're not getting hurt, falling down and getting up, you're probably not learning anything. And that puts that puts one at risk of spending their entire career trying to chase bottle like lightning to bottle it and that's really sad because when you learn from your failures or mistakes or whatever then you don't need to chase lightning you can just do the thing and know what's going to work the younger generation is looking at your work and they become inspired to be creative in their own way whether it's as a, a comic writer or a creative person in whatever they would like to be creatively how can they inspire the generation that follows them? Make it weird. Hmm. Look for a way to make it weird. Figure out what your twist is and lean into it. That's something that is probably unique to you. And it's going to be something that you care about probably. And it, because you care, you're going to have a really strong voice. Last question, the fun one, because, you know, we can't go introspective for the whole rest of the interview, is what would the comic title be for your life? And if you had a soundtrack associated with it, what type of soundtrack would you have? Oh, my. There's a few answers I can think of for this, for the comic title for my life. Certainly unpredictable consequences is an okay one. I have tried to start bits of career in various ways at the beginning of a surprisingly large number of once in a lifetime uh, economic collapses and it's getting quite frustrating. As for soundtrack, I know something by like, you know, early to middling Nine Inch Nails, like, or Underworld, or some kind of trip hobby. Mm -hmm sort of urban, driving beat, slightly angry. Angry in the way where you're hopeful for the future, which is the best kind of anger. I need to be angrier at more things. 
Well, Danny, I do hate to say this, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Kurt. I had a really great time, and I look forward to telling you all about the ridiculous bullshit I make up in the future. (laughs) Thanks a lot for having me, Kurt. Uh, I really look forward to seeing you again and telling you about the exciting projects I end up working on in the future. Now you have both. Before I like to go, uh, where, can you, where can we find you online and how can we support you uh, in your future projects with whatever they may be? I don't post on social media very often, but I'm on Twitter at DJ Crash Override. My next uh, release will be Sinus Imperium issue two. So that's going to be early June. There is a link on the screen. So uh, I'm sure that'll end up in uh, the doobly-doo or wherever. Those are great places to find me. I My Twitter has a link to my mailing list as well, where I give people free stuff and don't bother them very much. Well, thank you again for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Of course, you can find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our main website because, you know, I'm only one person. I can only do so much. And that is youtube.com forward slash TGT media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.